for joining us for Coffee Conversations. Today we have with us Jennifer Lloyd, who is our K-5 ELA Curriculum Specialist and our Program Coordinator for RISE. Jennifer, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. So we know we have the RISE programming started earlier in the summer, but for those who may not be aware, can you tell us a little bit about the RISE Summer Learning Program? Happy to do so. So RISE is our K-12 comprehensive summer learning program. Um, It is a part of our response to House Bill 82, which is a school extension program from North Carolina legislation. Um, And in this program, we're able to offer um, multiple uh, opportunities for our students to participate, um, primarily for academic intervention. Um, We gave our students some options to participate in person, virtual. They could participate in session one or session two or both sessions. Um, But this provides opportunities for our students K-12 to receive academic intervention for 150 hours or six weeks during the summer um, in the areas of reading and math for our K-5, reading math science. Um, We also have PE, world languages, music, art, um, social emotional learning. Um, and for our 612 classes or courses or students, um, we have ELA, math, science, biology, EOC courses, grad course recovery, CTE credentialing, um, just a plethora of opportunities for our students to catch up, to have academic intervention, to get that head start for next year, um, to earn those course credits, um, whether it's initial credit or grad course recovery to earn those CTE credentials, and to also just have an opportunity to to experience um, more in-person learning. Um, So it is a K-12 comprehensive program. We've already completed session one. We're getting ready to start session two that's going to start on July 12th. Um, But it has two components to it, essentially. Component one is academic intervention, and we also have component two, which is acceleration for all. Mm -hmm. So the RISE program definitely can meet students with a variety of needs. Um, And you mentioned that the first session started already and and has already ended. Was that a a success? And did it accomplish what it was intended to accomplish? Oh, yes, absolutely. I mean, I think um, anytime we are opening our buildings for our students um, after the pandemic and giving opportunities for students to have in-person learning, Um, opportunities for our students and teachers to work together on in a small group structure to get um, to provide our students some more intensified tutoring um, strategic small groups to have opportunities for social emotional learning um, not to mention all of the academic opportunities so I would absolutely say that it has met the goal we've had great participation um, whether it's in person or virtual Um, it really has been a full district team effort from child nutrition to um, our arts program, to our counseling program, social emotional learning, to the academics, to transportation. Um, it's, it's all hands on deck and it's just been a great experience, I would say, for our schools, for our teachers and for our students um, and for our parents as well to have this opportunity to um, engage in additional learning with their students, whether it's in person or virtual, just to extend that learning. Um, So I would say absolutely, it's been a great success, absolutely has met the goal. Um, And we're continuing, I would say the large majority of our students who are participating are participating in both sessions, in session one and session two, which that really says a lot that 
our students and our families want to commit to six weeks <laughs> of academic intervention uh, during the summer. And so that really, that speaks volumes as to their needs, their desires, and their level of participation. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So um, we finished session one. And when is session two um, academic intervention set to begin? And when will the information regarding session two be shared with parents and students? All right. So our session two begins on July 12th. Um, Students and parents will have already received their um, confirmation. So if they were registered prior, you know, prior and they were registered from April 29th on, or if they put their name on the wait list, they would have received our final acceptance and confirmation approximately two weeks ago in their student CCS email. Um, And now what we're waiting to receive or to send out to our students is not the confirmation and the site acceptance, but it's the transportation information. And so they should have already received their site assignment. They know which site they're going to, whether they're attending in person or virtual, et cetera. And now um, they should expect to see if they required transportation. Of course, they not, not all of them did. But if they did require it, they should expect to see that in their student CCS email um, between July 8th through the 11th. Um, and they'll get those route times, their pickup times, et cetera. Okay. And the, what is the goal of compo- component two acceleration for all? And is it an option for all students in K-12? I'm giving you two part questions. Right? I'm sorry. But those, no, those are really important questions. So the first is, so the answer is yes and yes. The answer is it's completely optional. Um, one of the things that I love about acceleration for all is that students can participate at any level that they wish to participate. Of course, we would want them to, I mean, I want to encourage all of our students to participate from the beginning to the end. But part of our our design and acceleration for all was to create an asynchronous, purely optional, purely independent virtual program um, engagement learning experience for our students because we know a lot of our families are on vacation. A lot of the, our students are working. A lot of our students are in daycare or, you know, different um, summer schedules. And so we wanted to create something that could be very, very flexible and that they could participate at any level at any time during that three-week period. And so that that's the goal of Acceleration for All, one of the goals. The other goal is to, we always say the phrase, review and preview. So academic intervention is really all about that review, getting that targeted academic intervention instruction. You know, what is it that you're missing? Let me get that to you, give you multiple opportunities to have that engagement. Acceleration for all is really about looking back and looking forward, right? So I'm going to preview those standards from my previous grade level that I may have struggled with, but I'm also, or review, but I'm also going to preview. So if I'm going into fourth grade next year, I'm going to look at my third grade standards and have a review of those, but I'm also going to preview and prep for the next school year. And so that's our goal for Acceleration for All, is to give our students and parents opportunities for review and preview of grade level standards. So if I am a ninth grader, I'm going to be reviewing ninth grade standards and previewing 10th grade content and standards to give our students an opportunity to get that leg up um, to get started a little bit earlier. Um, You asked a really important question, which is it open for all? So it absolutely is. Hence the name Acceleration for All. You know, we opened up academic intervention for everyone. Um, It was initially based on eligibility criteria, and then we opened it up to the wait list. Um, And so it did turn that academic intervention was really available to all students, but Acceleration All is absolutely available to all students. And that content is really developed for all students because it's a review and preview. And so um, the other good thing is you'll have courses that once they register, we'll send them information in their student CCS email about various links and courses for them to um, join. And in that, You'll see, for example, if you're a ninth grader, you would have the ninth grade and then 10th grade content. So you could see both. Um, Same thing on our K-5. It's going to look a little bit different in that there'll be um, videos and content directly accessible on the district website. So I'm in third grade this year. I'm going into fourth grade. 
But let's say I want to go back and look at third grade standards, or maybe I want to go all the way in fourth grade and I bump up and look at fifth grade too. I have access to all of that content. So I can make that choice and kind of pick and choose and, and fill my cart with the content and the experience that I want to, to enjoy during that time. So um, we're really trying to make it flexible, make it um, independent with you know, it's independent, it's asynchronous content, but we also want to give support. So all of our experiences, learning experiences are supported by a calendar of um, live synchronous support from our classroom teachers that we're, that will be supporting Acceleration for All. So even though I may log in and I watch this video and I do this activity, I don't really understand. So who can I ask? That's where that calendar of office hours um, instructional support comes in. Now I can log in at this time and I can get help from this teacher. I can ask the questions. I have access to that teacher to email and get support, things like that. So it is completely virtual, but it is also, I think, pretty, pretty personalized in that I can, you know, participate at the level that I want to participate at the, that my schedule will allow. And then I can also seek additional help, support if I need it. And if I don't need it, I can keep rolling on. So um, again, just trying to create lots of flexible, um, meaningful opportunities for our students. Mm -hmm. And Jennifer, I think you spoke to this before, but if students participated in component one, academic intervention, are they also eligible to participate in component two, acceleration for all? So the answer is yes and yes, because um, academic intervention happens from eight to 315 during these six weeks, right? Set time periods. Acceleration for All does have set time periods and that is July 12th through the 29th. That's when we'll make that content available. Um, we do have set office hours for our teachers um, to provide that specific support so students know when to log in and that schedule will be posted on the district website. But they can choose to work on the content at any point in time. So even if I'm in fifth grade, and I am attending um, component one academic intervention at Stedman, and I still want to log in and look at some of the content and, and view some of the videos and do some of the activities and work and things like that in Acceleration for All, I am absolutely able to do that. Same with 612. So let's say I'm attending, I'm over at Jack Britt during the day. I'm not, you know, I leave there at 3 15. Um, but there's content on there for the next grade level that I want to look at in Acceleration for All. I can absolutely participate in that. So just want to encourage our students that if you even think that you may want to have access to it or participate in on at any level to go ahead and register using that um, link on the district website so that we can send you the course links to join as well as the video links. Okay. And the registration for component two. Um, what is the timeline for students to register, families to register if they're interested in their children participating in component two? So all along, we've sort of had deadlines. That's what everybody was catching up like. When does it close? When does it do that? And we did close. Uh, academic intervention wait list is closed. You can no longer sign up for academic intervention. But with Acceleration for All, we're not going to close it. The reason being is because you can participate in any or all of it. And so we're really going to leave it open till almost the very end. <laughs> um, and so if you decide on the 24th that you want to participate, you'll be able to fill out that registration. We just need 24 hours. We'll probably get it to you sooner than that, but we're not going to guarantee that because we've got to have someone access it and things like that. So you can't, um, you know, you register, check your student CCS email. That's where the links will be. And again, we're saying, you know, within 24 hours of when you register, that those links will be sent to you. So that registration opened, I think, two weeks ago. Um, we have a great, great response. Lots of students already signed up. We have not sent the links out because we're waiting until we get some more um, and, and send out that, that big email blast at one time. Um, but like I said, we're not going to close it. So let's say you change your mind. July 14th, you're like, oh, I forgot to register. Can I go ahead? And yes, you absolutely can. Go to that district website, click that link and register and sign up. And the reason why you're registering, um, because once you register, you're in. You're in for Acceleration for All. There's no like, oh, well, there wasn't room. You didn't get in. You're automatic, automatically in. The only thing we have to have your registration for is we do want to have a record of participation. 
And we also need to be able to email you the links. <laughs> so we can't just have all of our our WebEx links open and all of these Canvas courses. So we want to give, um, we have to have secure links sent. So that is what's being sent to your student CCS email account are those joining links and the WebEx links, et cetera. Okay. And if families could still have any other questions, if they're not sure, they have additional questions, um, how can they get those questions answered? So the easiest way is to go to the district website. Um, I always like to hear our wonderful uh, people who are answering our phones, guiding our parents to the easiest way is to go to that district website, um, ccs.k12.nc.us. Go up to the top, right at the top, there's a banner that has CCS Rise there. Click that. I think there's another little video button there that takes you there as well. Um, but click that. It's going to take you to a lot of information about RISE. Um, but it will also take you to the Acceleration for All registration link. Um, it will also give you information. Um, two, two places that you can go to if you have questions, especially for Acceleration for All. So for academic intervention, we're kind of directing you to, if you know your child is assigned to one of the 23 summer learning sites, reach out to that site, reach out to that site-based administrator there. For Acceleration for All, we want you to reach out to our district team. And so um, two things that I want to I want to give today, um, and that is the email, and that's our CCS Rise email, and it's ccsrise2021 at ccs.k12.nc.us. And then also we have our RISE hotline where we have people answering. Um, and if they don't get back to you right away, send that email because, you know, voicemail and it goes to that. So, um, but the, the hotline is 910-475-1291. And we'll have people answering those emails, have people answering that hotline all the way through um, July 29th. So do not hesitate to reach out, email make that phone call to that hotline um, and let us know how we can help you because we definitely want to get as many of our students participating in Acceleration for All and getting a head start, um, a leg up on, on next school year. Thank you so much. Thank you, um, Jennifer, for joining us and sharing an update about RISE. So excited to hear that um, session one or component one went well. We're sure component two is going to go well as also. So families, if you're interested in your child participating in component two of RISE Acceleration for All, you've been provided the information, check out the district website or the hotline and find out information that's needed and sign your children up to receive a leg up to prepare for the upcoming school year. We have with us today, Mr. Sherelle Raines, who is our District Section 504 Coordinator and Dropout Prevention Supervisor. Mr. Raines, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so very much, Ms. George. I'm happy to be here. We are going to talk today about the Get Back in School launch event that is scheduled to take place in July. So can you tell us a little bit about this Get Back in School event? Wonderful. I'm so very excited to do that. So we have an initiative in this district to assist students and their families with, number one, obtaining all of the information that they may need in order to get those students reengaged and reconnected in school so that they can complete their high school diplomas. What we find is that families are not always aware of the resources and options available. So the premier purpose of this event is to educate, but also to facilitate. We want students and families to know what the various options are, and then to be able to provide them with some instant support to get them back on track and to get them in queue to receive their high school diplomas. That is excellent. And we know that you have been really focused in on this work here in Cumberland County. What are some of the reasons that our students have um, had for dropping out of school? A good question. I typically begin by sharing that the National Dropout Prevention Center has 10 
reasons that students predominantly drop out of school. But of course, we narrow our focus here in Cumberland County and consider those things that we see that are specific to our district. And so out of those 10, I've narrowed those down to the top three reasons. The number one reason that students drop out of school is a lack of engagement or a lack of attention. So people may say, well, how are you going to make school more interesting? Well, believe it or not, there's an answer for that. It's not so much that you have to have lessons in which teachers are standing on their heads or putting on what we like to call dog and pony shows. But when we talk about student interest, it's actually related to whether or not they are in courses that provide them with the skills to do what they want to do as adults. So we're talking about workforce readiness. We're talking about innovative classes, which we do offer in all of our comprehensive high school and exceptionally well at our schools of choice. So we're talking about those students being able to learn what they need to learn to do what they want to do. And a lot of times when they say they're bored or they're not engaged, they're not talking about whether or not the teacher is just teaching Romeo and Juliet. They're talking about whether or not they have CTE courses. They're talking about whether or not what they see in the classroom aligns to where they see themselves in the future. So that's one of the things that we really like to educate students, parents, and educators alike on. When we talk about engagement, it's not just about whether or not you sound like the clear eyes guy on a commercial, but it's about whether or not you have learned students enough to know what they want to do and help them select the right programs, the right courses, and perhaps the right campus to utilize what resources we have available to them so that they can achieve success. One of the second indicators that we have here is attendance and truancy. A lot of students are dropped from the role because they just don't come to school. And we find that a lot of those students don't come to school for the reasons that I just mentioned, engagement and interest, but also we have a lot of students who have now started to go to work to try to support their family with another stream of income. So one of the things that we also tell those students and those families are, there are things that you can do. Now, when I say things you can do, I'm not suggesting that anybody gets to shirk the um, graduation requirements. I'm specifically meaning there are programs that still prepare students for the workforce to enter it at a higher rate of pay. So sometimes we look at families who say, look, we need the money, but then we can educate them and say, with this amount of time or investment, the student has this many courses remaining. And if they do it this way, if they link with these resources, if they gain these skills, they can hereby make this much more income and it compounds over time and it puts your family in a different situation. But sometimes people just simply need to be empowered with information. We sometimes make decisions based on what we know right now. And what we have realized is that what people know right now isn't all that they can know. A third reason that we see students disengage in Cumberland County is because of other life choices. For example, we have students um, who may have children or students whose situations or circumstances have changed. They've disengaged and they're just not sure how to come back. So a part of what we do is let those students know that there are other community agencies and county level agencies that will provide them with a myriad of resources to help them through those immediate hardships. And sometimes, again, they just don't know what all options that they have. We do have non-traditional options as well. So it's all about better educating the populace so they will understand what they can do and get back on track to success. Thank you for sharing the reasons why some of our students have um, come to different obstacles in life and how Cumberland County Schools is designed to help them get back on track so that they can graduate. Now, the question that we always ask now when we talk about events is, is this virtual or is this face to face? Yes, in, indeed. In the past, we've been able to have a face to face event. However, with COVID restrictions in place, we are once again having a virtual event. So everything will happen via WebEx. And so I'm certain that you'll ask 
So I'll just lean, lean right on into that question. So people want to know, well, how do I find out what the link is? How do I access the WebEx? And that's where it gets a little more particular because there are different pieces and parts of the process that students and families will engage in. So there's more than just one link per se, but we handle all of that process through our telephone registration. So we have people who make calls or people can also call us. We have a hotline that we use just for that purpose. And we can get the information that we need from the families and then get that registration link or those links to them so that they can access the event. And any family who has questions or who would seek to register can call that hotline at 910-475-111. Four five nine one zero four seven five one one four five, and anybody who misses that can also find this information posted in our rolling banner on the CCS webpage. So again, we can get you registered, we can get your information, we can give you information. Call that hotline if someone does not call you, because people are also calling students as well. Okay, that was key. How do we register? Where do we get the link? So thank you for sharing that and that hotline information. So if families have additional questions, if they are unsure of where they fall or whether this event is for them, um, where should they uh, con- where should they look or get additional information? Should they Indeed. use the hotline or the website? Yes, ma'am. I'd say call the hotline. As you can imagine, the website is going to have general information, but the more sp- specific the questions may be, they'll need to talk to a person in the flesh. So call the hotline because again, we don't want a one size fits all this. This is specific to the individual student. Students and families will work individually with a high school counselor and social worker to put together an individualized plan per student. So those specific questions Call the hotline. We'll get some information from you. We'll get you in queue for a counselor and social worker to make some additional contacts. And we will identify what steps are necessary for every individual person. Okay. It's individualized. So I don't know if we mentioned the date and the time for this at this point, but if students or families are not able to participate in this virtual event, Are there other options for those students or families? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. So the virtual event will take place on July 15th. It will begin at 11 a.m. And again, specialized information will be given to individuals. But 11 a.m. is our official start time on July 15th. And even beyond the event, that's what our dropout prevention office handles. And as the dropout prevention supervisor, we will continue to facilitate and provide services to those families in need. And we also continue to keep up with those families who participate in the program. So just coming to the virtual event that day is not the one-stop shop. We will continue to provide resources, support, and services for the duration. Any family who has additional questions even beyond the event can continue to call us. Now, once the hotline ends, that's okay because the hotline is not always open. The hotline will actually end on July 24th. So you'll notice that the hotline even exceeds or extends the event itself for the purpose of questions. But even if after July 24th, um, individuals have additional questions, they can contact Cumberland County Schools. Um, even if they call our switchboard, which is 678-2300, and ask for the dropout prevention supervisor, and they will be directed to the right place, and they will continue to receive support and services. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Um, It sounds like a wonderful opportunity for students who um, have come into different situations in life, life happens. Um, And there's still an opportunity for them to get back in school and to graduate. So, Mr. Raines, before we wrap up, can you again share with us the day and the time for the Get Back in School event and also that hotline number one more time? 
Yes, ma'am. Be happy to. So my parting commercial, if you have dropped out of school, we're ready for you to drop back in. We want you to reconnect. We want you to re-engage. We want you to understand just how powerful you are and how much potential you have. And we want to remind you that you have people who are willing to push you and to support you, to see you be the successful you that you know you can be and that we know you can be. So we want you to receive additional information on July 15th, beginning at 11 a.m. at our virtual back to school launch party event. Again, that's July 15th at 11 a.m. To register and for additional information, you can dial our hotline 910-475-1145. 910-475-1145. And we look forward to working with you, to seeing you succeed and smiling, clapping, and cheering for you when you do. Thank you, Mr. Rain, so much for sharing that information. July 15th is that virtual event. Families, please make sure you call the hotline, contact Mr. Rains in our dropout prevention office, um, and let's get back in school and graduate. We have with us Dr. Jennifer Green from Cumberland County Department of Public Health, as well as our very own Shirley Bolden, who is our Director of Health Services. Thank you both for joining us um, today to talk a little bit about COVID-19 vaccines for children, as well as immunizations as we prepare to go back to school in August um, or July for our year-round schools. So let's go ahead and get started. Again, thank you so much for joining us. We know that students ages at age 12 are eligible to receive the Pfizer COVID-19 vaccine. What factors should families consider when they're trying to decide whether or not to get their children vaccinated? That's a great question. So the CDC's recommendation, the Centers for Disease Control recommendation is that everyone age 12 and up should get um, vaccinated and we want you to get vaccinated as soon as possible. A couple other factors that you might consider, um, especially if your child may be in sports or um, whether that's cheerleading or football or volleyball, but in particular, those close contact sports. And um, we really want those families to get vaccinated um, as we prepare to go back to school in the fall in person. And um, we want them to be uh, protected as they, as they go back into the classroom. And so um, everyone 12 and older. Um, in the past couple of weeks, the CDC um, and their advisory committee has met to uh, review and discuss data about um, these very mild and very rare cases of inflammation of the heart muscle that surrounds um, the tissue. And we call that um, myocarditis or pericarditis uh, following their COVID-19 vaccination. And particularly this is showing up in younger people. But what this advisory committee found and was very clear on is that this side effect is extremely, extremely rare. And there's only a very small number of people that experience this after their vaccination. And in fact, that the folks that do experience this, the cases are mild, the individuals cover, recover on their own with um, very minimal treatment or even on their own. And that actually, if you, the risk for these two conditions, this inflammation of the heart muscle is actually more common if you get COVID. So one way to protect yourself against these conditions um, as a result of getting COVID is um, to get yourself vaccinated. And, and really the risk um, from a COVID infection is more severe if you get COVID than if you get the COVID vaccine. So um, this is, I know this is something that's been, um, folks have been asking about, but the guidance is very clear um, from not just the CDC, but all of our, our um, prominent health agencies that we want children, every um, students age 12 and up to get vaccinated as soon as possible. And just to add to um, Dr. Green's comments, we also want families to consider that if you get your child vaccinated and they're exposed at school and um, they would not have to quarantine 
you know, as long as they can provide proof of the vaccination record, they would be able to remain in-person learning. And so that's definitely an advantage. And also, if you have anyone in your home who is uh, not well because they are uh, struggling with cancer or, or some other health condition, you also know that your family and your child has um, a less risk of bringing COVID-19 home because they're vaccinated. Okay. Um, as we know that the Pfizer COVID-19 vaccination was recently approved um, for students to 12 and up. How effective, um, if there's any information about the effectiveness of it, is it for students? Yeah, that's a great question. We haven't seen any different levels of effectiveness in children than we have uh, for adults by and large. And so the COVID vaccine is 94, 95% effective against preventing um, that severe, severe illness for COVID. Um, we'll still learn more about um, what that looks like in young people, but this is one of our highly effective vaccines. I mean, this is, in terms of effectiveness, um, this is on the top end of, of vaccines. It's really incredible that our researchers and our scientists were able to uh, develop this vaccine um, that was so effective um, in a very rigorous way. Um, but also in a way that was uh, uh, fast and efficient. Mm -hmm. um, so we, we've talked about the COVID-19 vaccine, Pfizer, for students 12 and over. Um, but we know that another piece of our K-12 puzzle is immunizations. So what is the deadline for our children entering grades, kindergarten, seventh grade, and 12th grade? What is the deadline for their immunization? Okay, students who um, enroll will have 30 days from their first date of attendance to, um, to present the required health assessment or immunization. And that doesn't matter if it's face-to-face -face or virtual, they're still expected to present those immunization records within 30 days of their first day of attendance. Okay, and are health assessments required for all students? Any student who is new to North Carolina or attending a North Carolina school for the first time is required to, in a, a public school, uh, North Carolina public school. So you can be in a private school in North Carolina, but if it's your first time attending a North Carolina public school, you must submit the North Carolina Health Assessment Revised 2016 form. Um, you have 30 days from the first day of enrollment for that form as well. Beyond the vaccine, are there any other helpful tips regard or safety tips around COVID-19 that families should consider as they prepare to return to school in the fall? Yeah, so a couple of things I can think of. One, of course, I have to repeat, um, we want you to get your child vaccinated for COVID. And then, of course, to make sure you have all those other uh, required back-to-school immunizations. And those are important because if your child does get sick, and we don't want to complicate that with some other communicable disease. But a couple of things off the top of my head um, come to mind. One, uh, making sure your child stays home when they are sick. So if they're experiencing any other um, symptoms, whether they're COVID-related or not, um, we want you, if you have a sick kiddo, to keep that child at home. That protects um, your, your student, but also others around them and, and our staff, faculty and staff as well. Um, and then make sure that you know. Um, your students know the health and safety precautions that we would have for any um, communicable disease, COVID or not, especially if those that are attending for their, their first time in school. So hand washing, how to cover your cough, um, where to put their tissues in the trash. And they seem like simple things, but those are, are items that really help um, our school district staff, our school nurses, our teachers um, to help um, keep um, the other students protected, but also everybody that's working in that building um, protected. And so, and that mean might mean for you, of course, taking their temperature, um, especially if they're feeling feverish and keeping them home when they're sick. Mm -hmm. Is there any additional information you'd like to leave with our families today? Well, I, I also want to encourage them when your child has an upset belly, please keep your child at home. We have a lot of kids coming to school and they say they had an upset belly um, or they say I vomited the night before, but I'm better this morning to at least keep your child home for 24 hours and really don't self-diagnose, but rely on your primary care provider. 
you know, stay in close contact with your child's pediatrician. If you don't have one, you can be happy to call the health department or call over to the health services, and we'll be happy to help you connect with some resources for the medical community. Um, but it's just very important that your communication line stays very open with the school. And if there is someone who is positive for COVID, the flu, or, or uh, any contagion in your home, please keep your child home. Uh, we will make sure that they have access to learning. And if you need assistance, again, call health services, call the health department, and we're going to reach out and get those resources to you. And I just remind parents that um, we we love to, as Ms. Bolden mentioned, we love to see you at the health department. Um, we'll get you a phone number to call here in a moment. Um, but don't wait until the first day of school or just a few days before school starts to um, make that appointment to get your immunizations. Um, do that early. Take July to do that uh, because uh, we tend to see an influx of calls right before schools or right before school starts or um, after in those first 30 days. And then our clinic gets very busy and we want to make sure we can serve you the best way that we can. So um, call now, make that appointment so we can get you in and get you seen and you'll have that checked off your back to school list um, before school starts. And one other thing may I add is that if you miss your 30 day deadline, but you have an appointment for the next week, there are no extensions. So your child will be dismissed from school until that appointment has been met and they provided the required documentation to school. So your school principal cannot give an extension. Uh, again, it's 30 days from the first day of attendance. And if you don't have that appointment met by that time, your child will be dismissed and provided, of course, educational opportunity in the home setting. But we want all of your babies in school so we can teach them face to face. So we know that there's an event coming up Saturday, July 31st. Um, Cumberland County Department of Public Health will be hosting a COVID-19 and back to school vaccination and immunization clinic. Can you give us a little more information regarding this event and how do families participate? Yes, we're very excited about this. Um, it will be a Saturday clinic for those families that um, might work during the week. This is your, your time and your opportunity to do that. Um, you will be able to come to the health department, um, get your COVID vaccine um, at, at no cost. Um, we'll have uh, back to school immunizations as well. And so every all the vaccines that you need if you're entering school for the first time, our seventh graders and our 12th graders that need their um, uh, Tdap vaccines and their meningococcal vaccines um, and any other of those uh, recommended vaccines will get for you. If you are not sure which vaccines you get, please, you need, please give us a call. We'll work, we'll help you through that, especially if you have a, a kid or um, students that are entering school for the first time. Um, you, you might not know what they need or if they're up to date, we can help you with that. So please give us a call. That phone number is 910-433-3600, 910-433-3600. Um, and we do want you to make an appointment for those um, back to school immunizations just so that we can make sure we have plenty of time to see you and your family. Um, but if you're just popping in for a COVID vaccine, um, you don't need to do that. Um, lots of folks ask uh, Shirley and I, Ms. Bolden and I, when they can take your masks off. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, the way and the path forward there is to get more people vaccinated. We need more of our, our young people vaccinated. Um, and don't forget, if you do that right now, the governor um, in our state has a lottery um, available so that if you do enter, if you do get vaccinated, your child can have an opportunity to win um, $125,000 for their post-secondary education. And um, they've already named one winner, and I'm sure that was a happy mom and dad uh, for that one. So um, that, that's a great opportunity. So don't forget to do that. And that'll be 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. that day. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that information. Saturday, July 31st, Cumberland right. County Public um, Department of Public Health will host this COVID-19 and back to school vaccination and immunization clinic. So families who want their children vaccinated or know they need to have um, immunization um, things done before school starts, definitely keep that date on your calendar. Is there anything else you would like to share with us before we um, wrap up for today? 
just want to go ahead and congratulate parents on meeting all of the deadlines in advance. Yes. We know that you're on top of it and we appreciate you already, you know, just doing everything you do to help us have this great comeback. And so we are ready. Uh, thank you again, uh, Dr. Green and I appreciate you following the three W's and uh, we're going to have a great school year. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Dr. Green, for joining us. Thank you, Ms. Bolden, as always, for giving us your um, support and making sure that our students are safe. Thank you, families, for joining us for our conversation today and have a wonderful day.